Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fiveable Stream on Impressionism. My name is uh, Liam Macklin. Can everyone hear me clear? Say hi in the chat box if you can hear me. Let's see if it's working. Can anyone say hi? Can you hear me? Let's see, my volume is up. Okay, so I see there are eight people on now. Okay, so yeah, welcome to Fiveable uh, live stream on Impressionism. So with everything that is going right now, so it might be a great chance actually to uh, join our live streams. So we have them a lot of them in Fiveable. So I encourage you everyone to come and join us to many of these uh, stream on variety of topics. So tonight we're going to talk about the Impressionists. Uh, and post-impressionists and a lot of uh, art movements. That, that's a weakness for a lot of students sometimes to identify paintings, uh, artists, and so forth. So a stream like this might be very beneficial to anyone who's joining in tonight. So, um, and again, remember Fiveable every day of the week if you're taking several APs. Thursday is um, history. Uh, they on Fiveable, so there's World History AP, U.S. History, and AP Europe at the same time. So again, might if you take uh, European History, U.S. History, World History, might help you in that category too. And remember, uh, follow Fiveable on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And again, you can watch here. Now it's free. You can watch all the replays as we're getting closer to the exam. If your school is shut down. Right now, some of these streams can be very, very beneficial, and I know some teachers are forwarding their students to watch some of the replays. So on today's stream, we're going to cover today, we're going to talk in general about 19th century uh, European art, kind of getting close to the 20th century. It's period four, so most of you in this stage are probably getting close to period four. In the chat box, anyone wants to tell us if they're not in period four yet? general period for is getting into from World War I, 1914 to current events. Uh, so getting close to period four, just above period four. So today we'll talk about 19th century art. Specifically tonight, we'll talk about Impressionism, a movement of art that originated in France. And we'll talk about post-Impressionist. And finally, about Cubism, which was created by Pablo Picasso. And why we're focusing specifically about these three movements in the key concept outline given by uh, the College Board. As you can see, I posted it here. You can see that they've indicated that they're interested in modern art, including Impressionist, Post-Impressionist, and Cubism. So that's why I'm focusing on them. The other ones are very interesting too, but they're not listed. Um, also, example of artists they've listed in the concept outline that we'll talk about some of them tonight, such as Monet, Matisse, Degas, and of course, the most famous of all, uh, Vincent van Gogh. Um, there's an uh, interesting documentary about it that you might want to see about the Impressionist. Uh, this band actually made a video of some of these famous paintings, so you might recognize some of these uh, paintings throughout the stream. So I'm just going to play this and see if you recognize any of these songs, any of these paintings. Anyone, if you recognize them, you can put in the chat room if you recognize any of these paintings. So yeah, these are some several famous impressionists and some art impressionist uh, paintings you might recognize. If anyone recognizes any of any painting, you can put in the chat box, tell us which you recognize. And hopefully by the end of this stream, you might uh, recognize some of these pictures that we're going to talk about. So quickly, timeline for art, 19th and 20th century. And again, you're taking AP Euro, you need to identify probably like 10 art movements are listed. We're starting from the Renaissance and finishing in postmodernism, so you might get confused as you get closer to the exam how to remember all these art movement. Uh, you just have to remember that each art movement 
uh, is just a reflection of what's going on in European history uh, during that time, Renaissance, rebirth, interest in classical times. So it's reflected in the art, Baroque um, uh, reaction of the Counter-Reformation. So it almost is all based upon what's going on in that time in the psyche of people. Uh, so just before Impressionism, you probably already talked about in class about realism. People are trying to make more realistic uh, painting. And today we're talking about Impressionism, uh, which kind of goes away from realistic and actually does not believe that there is such a thing as realistic painting. We'll talk about post-impressionist uh, in that context, and we'll focus on cubism, which was created by Pablo Picasso. That's the three one we're talking about. So this timeline might be helpful for you to set up uh, the order of things. Can everyone hear me? Is there any questions up till now? If you have any question, drop it in the chat box, or you have an option for uh, questions in the bottom. Um, all right, so let's start with the beginning of how Impressionism was born. And a big part of how Impressionism was born is the creation of a paint tube. Yes, so it's actually an American named John J. Rand, uh, who was in England, actually invented the paint tube. And again, today, if anyone dabbles in painting, it's very, very easy. You know, you just get a few paint tubes and uh, get an easel, and you're basically a painter. It's very, very easy. But in um, European times, we're talking about the 18th century and backwards uh, before this invention, it was very, very complicated to create paint. You needed a lot of resources from around the world and then you needed like to mash them out and create like pigments. It was very, very complicated issue. Now, John G. Rand basically created a paint tube that kind of transformed and made art uh, free because it was just very, very portable. And a big part of the Impressionist painters, as many of them, uh, did not paint in studios, but they went outdoors. So basically, as Renoir said, uh, put his quotation, without the tube paints, there would be uh, no Impressionism. So uh, being free from the studio and going outside and painting, making it a lot easier, is definitely the invention of the paint tube is a good place to start and make a connection that Impressionists a lot of time painted outdoors. That's a good starting point. And John J. Rand, he didn't have any other inventions I can name uh, after than the paint tube. So let's just get the basics. A lot of times you want to know each art movement, like when, what time it started, years and basic events. I just wrote for Impressionism. General years, 1865 to 1890, even though, again, if you might check some textbook, it might give you a little bit different years. The highlights might be the 1870 to 1880. That's the highlight of the Impressionism. Of course, the origins are in France. All of these painters um, uh, are from France. In the historical context, why Impressionism is coming about, it's definitely you might want a connection. Urbanization is happening. A lot of these painters uh, paint in uh, Paris and major cities. There's movement from uh, villages into Paris that is being uh, transformed by, uh, if you study in class, maybe Baron. Uh, Hausman, who kind of was the architect to kind of rebuild, redesign Paris uh, during the stage of Napoleon III. So definitely a lot of things going on uh, in Paris with urbanization. It's the context for the Impressionists, even though many of them also painted uh, nature. And also the second thing is the invention of the camera. Anyone wants to tell us in the chat room why would the camera transform painting? How is camera connected to painting? Anyone. Okay, so one option of the camera is a lot of people said, what's the point of painting now? Uh, if there's a camera, you can just take a picture of something. So why do you need to paint? And that's basically the background for impressionists to saying, well, it's not necessarily that I can be very accurate. I want to more uh, take a painting of something that it's my interpretation the way I see it, not necessarily the way you might see it. So a couple of key points of Impressionism. It focuses a lot of time on analysis of the color and light and nature. They don't like to use black and white. That's a very important thing you got to know about Impressionists. They like colors and they want to capture an atmosphere of a certain time in a certain part of the day. So with the weather condition, with the light, that's their interest, like what is happening in a certain part of the day. 
Um, and they were very interested in uh, small, brightly invisible colors and uh, visible brush strokes, basically. So not very accurate, but more like going across. Uh, and they were interested in uh, either in mundane earthly subject, they were interested in uh, what goes on in cities, regular people going to cafes or things like that, or uh, ballet classes, people just sitting by themselves. And they didn't put outline for their paintings uh, as opposed to many painters, many art movement before that. So the history of Impressionism, how was Impressionism started? Who are the main people into it? So let's get into the history of that. Any questions up till now? All right, so let's continue. So the history of Impressionism, basically, if you know anything about, uh, if you took, if you studied anything about uh, France up to now, you might have studied about Louis XIV or Versailles, or you probably talked about uh, Jacques Louis David, the most famous painter in French history. So the system in France was called, the academy was called the Salon. So that's where most painters, uh, anyone who wanted to be someone in France during uh, 17th, 18th century were basically, in the 19th century, wanted to get their painting into a salon. So it was a very uh, structured system. And if you got your painting into the salon, a committee will just judge if your painting is good enough to be into the salon. Once you got to be in the salon, then you basically had a big prestige and you got commissions and you won prizes and you basically kind of made it. Now, interestingly enough, the Impressionists are basically those who got rejected from the salons. Their paintings were not like uh, David level as far as the committee was concerned. And a specific event, uh, some history book point is the beginning of the Impressionist movement is in 1863 when the salon uh, reject, rejects uh, Manet, a uh, famous painting of luncheon on the grass, which I put here on the right side. You can see pretty fast why they would uh, reject uh, a painting like that. They just were very, very shocked to see a nude woman sitting with two guys. I'll show you a bigger picture of that, uh, uh, bigger version of this painting later on to see. So this painting was rejected as well as like 3,000 3, uh, of the 5,000 paintings that were submitted. But uh, Manet and a lot of other painters basically decided to kind of create the salon of all the refused ones, those who did not get accepted in. And that's basically the background of Impressionists, is those who got rejected from the establishment. They could not uh, have a show in the mainstream, so they basically created a side, uh, their own version of, like, let's just open our own gallery. So the salon, as you can see in this painting, this is where, this is where if you wanted to be an established painting, a painter, you would come and have your painting hung in a salon. That's what people, like, Jean-Jacques Louis David, um, Millet, and so forth wanted to 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 be that. Most painters in France wanted to be a part of that, but once they got rejected, they had to find another path. So, in 1874, these th around 30 artists basically uh, staged their first first exhibition, and they staged it. So you can see the building here. There's a picture of the building in the center floor. Uh, a uh, photographer who was a friend of many of them, his name was Nadar. He basically uh, provided the space and all of these artists just um, came over and just brought some of their paintings, all those that got rejected, hence they're kind of like the nickname, the Salon of the Refused. And another very important painter who um, was the kind of the financier of many of these artists, we'll actually see some of his painting. His name is Gustav uh, Kaibosch and he, He's also actually a very accomplished painter in himself. I personally see him as one of the best painters of Impressionism. Uh, he organized the event and financed many of these uh, paintings and uh, bought a lot of the paintings uh, to help his uh, Impressionist fans. So he's very, very important in helping that, but he's also a very talented painter on, by himself. He was just very rich. It was very helpful in establishing this. So the Salon of the Refuse was the first major exhibit of the Impressionists, and they would have something around like eight big exhibitions like that until people are kind of get kind of get bored of Impressionism and move to a different kind of uh, movement. Now, one of the first painting that was considered an Impressionist painting uh, was uh, Claude Monet uh, painting, which was actually called Impression, Impression Sunrise. 
uh, which was some people saw it just as a, as a sketch, they didn't even see it as a real painting, like it wasn't even a finished painting. And some French journalists wrote a review on it and criticized it as being like some sort of an impression. That's what the name Monet uh, called it, and they thought it was kind of like a joke. So a lot of times movement have a derogatory name that they get, and it end up actually a name that they eventually embrace. So. Uh, the artists just continue uh, exhibiting these painting and the nickname just stuck impressionist because that's just their impression of a painting. So this is the first uh, painting. Uh, I'll show you. This is the first painting uh, that it's actually called Impression Sunrise and is just the impression that uh, the painter is experiencing it at that moment and at that time. You know, if you came 30 minutes later and painted it, it would not look the same. Uh, the light will probably be here. So that's his impression from that painting. So four painters are mentioned in the key concept outline for impressionists. You don't have to know all four of them. One will be sufficient if you have to write an essay about it or just to recognize that they are all impressionists. But one of the founding fathers, if you will, of impressionism, of course, is Claude Monet, that you must, must have seen some of his painting if you went to any uh, major museum. By the way, just in general, we can also say that the most expensive selling paintings today that you probably are not aware of, they are actually impressionist painting. If you ever hear every few years or so, like the highest selling painting went for 300 million, 400 million, it's usually impressionist uh, paintings. They would have been shocked to believe that they're so popular today after they started as being refused. But that's kind of art for you. You get refused and 20, 30 years later, you know, you become like super, super, uh, your painting sell for millions of dollars. Same situation like with Van Gogh. So let's go over Monet basic details. So subject, what did he paint? Mainly he painted landscapes. Uh, the Rouen Cathedral is very, very famous painting of his and water lilies. He had a whole series of that. So that's kind of classic uh, impressionism going outdoors, uh, light colors, catching an atmosphere in a certain moment and very, very focused on the usage of light and color. And he liked a lot of time basically to sometimes paint several paintings of the same thing in different time of the day. So that's what he's famous for. So that's his famous painting. We just said Impression Sunrise. And this is his painting, painting of a haystacks. And you can just kind of see uh, if you, I wrote a question, what would you, do you notice of uh, of these three paintings, uh, what do you notice about these three separate paintings? Anyone in the chat room can tell us. So a big thing is he just painted them in different part of the day and the light is completely different. So it's the same location, but it just looks different. Uh, so that's something he was very, very interested in many other Impressionist painters we would love to see how the light reflects in a different time of the day and how the painting looks completely uh, different. That's another famous uh, painting they did, the Rouen Cathedral. Just so, uh, He just sat there one day and just painted. It was a series of like five different paintings. And you can see the color completely changes, depends on the sun. So this one is yellow more, and this one is more white. So again, depends on the time of the day when you paint uh, your painting. I was very, very interested in that. Uh, lily ponds, something he did a lot. The reflection of the trees in the water was something that impressionists were very, very interesting. Uh, also how their impression of that. The water lilies, which was a very, very long series of paintings that he uh, did in later years of his life. Um, okay, so let's move on. Monet and Manet. So it's very confusing. Names are very, very similar. So Manet, by the way, if you like, he gets the nickname of like the guy who created modern art. I think there's actually a documentary called Manet, the guy who created modern art. I saw it a long time ago. So he kind of he liked to. He was a very, very creative person. He liked. Um, updating classic uh, paintings. He was very, very interested in the classic, like Titian, for example, taking their old paintings and kind of updating, like giving them a modern twist, if you will. 
uh, in a contemporary sense. He likes uh, painting and bars and parks and cabaret, and he had a little hard edge to his painting. Um, uh, a lot of uh, art historians kind of seem as the transition between realism to impressionism or kind of like the first modern artists, if you really go into details in that. But again, this is just a survey level course. You don't really need to go in that deep of level of analysis, but just know that if there's one painter who transitioned us to modern time, Manet is definitely one guy you can use as an example. Um, and again, uh, like many of impressionist painter, he liked uh, loose brush strokes. That's something that a lot of impressionist painter had. So this is the painting that he had that was refused and created a big like shock. You know, this is a very shocking painting. Anyone wants to tell us in the chat room what's so shocking about this painting? You think for that time? Okay, so that, that was very, very shocking to people. And like, this is like, I think like 1860 something, 1863 or something, uh, to see a woman completely naked just sitting in the park and notice these two guys are like sitting in a regular suit and they're just looking towards you. Like, what's the big deal? You know, but for that time, you know, people were like shocked how like somebody wants to display something like that. Uh, the nudity and the look directly. So a lot of times it's not just the nudity, it's also the way um, the women are looking into without shame into uh, the guy who paints them. It's very, very shocking to conservative society. Here's another example. Like you look at the steady gaze uh, and a bashed pose, like just like a prostitute named Olympia. And it's interesting enough, this is a reworking of a classic uh, Titian uh, painting. Titian, if you might recall, is a Renaissance painter. So, um, and I really like taking classic paintings and kind of redo them. So this is the classical uh, Titian painting of uh, Venus of Urbino, which you can look and again, look at the look, looking straight into the face. And this is him kind of reworking uh, that painting. But the gaze is really, really what's interesting and the eyes looking straight into you. And that's something that very, very shocked the, the the art movement, art critics for that time. And again, a lot of time, notice the eyes, notice the looks. So this is like more of a, a bar scene of somebody who works behind the bar. She so definitely does not look too happy about uh, that situation. So it's not that completely realism is gone. An impression is painting, they are depicting regular situation, but they're also interested other than depiction of people, more uh, their, their impression of people in that certain moment and outdoors painting is something they're interested in a lot more than uh, before. So let's move on to the third uh, famous Impressionist painter, and that's Pierre-Auguste Renoir. And Renoir was also very interested in nudes. He actually did it more of a peach color, not white, as Manet. And he was very interested in cafe society, he actually painted a lot of children, flowers. He was kind of like more of the happy painter is considered. And like many, um, many uh, impressionist painter trying to avoid using black at all, if that's even possible. That's another thing if you want to remember about impressionism. They don't like using black, they like uh, colors. They also don't mix uh, the primary colors. And that's another category. So also quick brush strokes uh blurred uh blended the line kind of hazy that's another thing that people didn't like too much about impressionism it wasn't as focused as like renaissance or neoclassicism that everything came so bright and clear impressionism was kind of like a little hazy and that also was considered very very uh shocking and that's why they got rejected by the salons uh, so here's an example of Renoir depicting French society, uh, people sitting basically in a restaurant or cafe, you know, having a good time. And again, it captures a moment, a certain part of the day with a certain light. And you can kind of start analyzing the dynamic in the painting, you know, uh, who's looking where and who's looking. This woman is looking directly at us. This woman over here is looking into the guy who's sitting here. This guy on top is looking. So we can just kind of see the dynamic of like... Uh, Cafe society, that's something that looks like something, you know, might have done be done 
uh, today, just painting people in a certain society. And again, you have a camera, you can take a picture of that, but that's the impression that he's getting from that moment. Also interesting, down here, we just found out long ago, this is Gustav Kaibosch, the guy I told you earlier about, who sponsored many of um, the Impressionist movement and bought a lot of their painting because he was a very wealthy guy and also a painter himself. And by the way, he looks nothing like that if you look at his... Uh, self-portrait he looks nothing like the person over here but again you know that's self that's impressionism he looks a lot more relaxed than he does in his own self-portrait so that's the way he sees himself and that's the way Renoir sees them so it's two different things uh on the terrace and again we're seeing urban society notice the vivid blue uh vivid red children in painting that's kind of a new thing also we're starting to see a lot more emerge with uh the 19th century um uh, then Moulin de la Galette was a very, very famous uh, hangout place for many of the artists and the artistic society of Paris. Many, many famous, all the famous French people attended that uh, place. So Moulin de la Galette is very, very known. So this is the dance in the Moulin de la Galette, which kind of, again, we kind of get the urban uh, French society uh after Napoleon III, also, if we use the context, after France, France was defeated by Germany. So this place um, is very, very, has a lot of interesting for artistic people. Uh, nudes, as we mentioned, Renoir with his kind of like orange uh, nudes that he liked to create, like our orange pink. Uh, finally, maybe number four from the four people listed for us to study about Impressionism is... Edgar Degas, uh, who also came, most of these painters were actually not, uh, we came, were not uh, wealthy. Degas was actually kind of wealthy, not as wealthy as Kaibosch, but he, he had some money. He uh, liked to paint ballerinas. That was his thing. If you see ballerina, most likely it's Degas, uh, which not too many people painted the uh, ballerinas before. So that's a new topic. Cafe society, as we saw earlier on, by Renoir, uh, humans uh, in everyday life depicted loneliness, uh, kind of offbeat angles, asymmetrical. Uh, but he, compared to all the all the other impressionists, was not like an outdoors person. So you see, it's we kind of get we're trying to um, describe and give characteristic to every art movement, and then, but not everyone falls to follow exactly all the categories. So their guy's a little bit different than the classic, but he's an impressionist painter. Um, uh, also, we can see here a sculpture over here that he did. We have uh, uh, a, a dancing ballet that we talked about, so a dance rehearsal. And again, that's an impression, a certain moment, a certain time when somebody's going to stretch or somebody's going to lean forward. That's his impression uh, from that moment. And that you know can never be taken again. Uh, the dance class also, we see the teacher, we see the students lining up in performance. Uh, Absentine Drinker, also a very, very famous painting. We can kind of see like, uh, interesting in today's context, a little social distancing. Uh, you know, people are sitting by themselves in a cafe society, in urban city, not everyone necessarily is happy. So it's not all happy, smiling paintings. There's some sadness today. A lot of people think, oh, impressionist painting, they're all happy and it's all like colors. And like, no, there is there is some edge for that period of time. Today, it seems very commercialized, but for that time, this is very, very um, edgy for that period of time. Finally, the guy who gets overlooked and is not listed here, but maybe you can write about him in your essay and pray, impress the essay reader is Gustav Kaibosch, who came from a very, very wealthy uh, family. And I showed you that's him actually here in the bottom. And that's him in real life. And he looks nothing like over here. That's really, really interesting. So he was a core member of the Impressionist Society, but is not listed in the college board. Uh, his work differs a little bit because it's more realistic, but he belongs to the Impressionist uh, painters because he also used uh, visible brush strokes. And most people today talk about him as the patron of the Impressionist, but you have to know that his paintings uh, are very, very um, 
are very, very famous, and not just in the realistic sense, but he's still an impressionist. And he also had a lot of interest in photography. So remember, photography is something that a lot of people, a lot of these artists are trying to think about how, the, what is their difference between uh, what they do and actually taking an accurate uh, painting. So this is probably his most famous painting. You probably have seen this one before. Anyone seen this painting before in the chat box, chat room? I think it used to be like in, I think it has to be in some of the textbooks if you're using McKay. I think it's in that textbook. Um, anyway, this is one of, uh, this is considered his masterpiece. Uh, a lot of people think this is a just a realistic painting, realism. It is realistic, but it's done during the Impressionist time, and some people get confused when you tell them this is actually Impressionism. But anyway, uh, this is kind of like a manifesto maybe of the of New Paris, basically. Uh, and it's kind of the relationship between the city dweller and the environment in it. So again, we see these two more in focus, and these in the back are kind of like uh, moving away. But this is kind of like paintings that are kind of, again, more familiar to us. People in the city, people in walking. It's a rainy day in Paris. You know, everyone is kind of do, doing their thing, walking around in the city. So it's a very, very popular painting. A lot of time used as an example of realism, even though it's actually done by an Impressionist painter with a realistic aspect to it. The same thing as we can see in this uh, European bridge painting that we see the dog walking over here is again the energy in the city of the walking this guy's over here you know he's got his hand over he's thinking or contemplating i mean who knows what's going on in his head in that moment you know his job his wife whatever he's thinking at that moment this guy is leaning over maybe he's having a conversation so again the urban city um people doing their work uh but everything is moving together uh, the Floor Scraper is a very, very famous painting. Very, very interesting. This actually was painted in Kai Bosch uh, studio. And again, it was very, very wealthy. These people are probably scraping his uh, floor and like, you know, making everything uh, from new. So we can kind of see the action, the motion moving forward and scraping in one line. And again, some people see this, of course, and saying it's a real, it's more realism, depicting regular people doing action in a day-to-day situation very very interesting painting uh okay so that's basically about impressionism we're going to move on to post impressionism any questions about impressionism up till now and remember you can drop in the ask the question section all right so let's move on to the post impressionism which is a new art movement and again the term when we say art movement what do we mean when we say art movement it's just a group of painters that kind of have like the same outline of what they're looking for, what they want to create. So if you have the Impressionists, they were like in a group of people, they presented things together. And but, you know, art changes. So post-Impressionist is kind of starts around the 1880 with people got getting tired of Impressionism. But it's kind of an extension of Impressionism. And they also used vivid colors. Uh, thick application of can of the paint, uh, that distinctive brush strokes, and they move for more real life subjects, kind of more of a kibosh and less like from uh, just depicting nature, and paid more attention to detail and structure than the impressionists did. Now, who are the famous painters you might want to know from post impressionism? Of course, Cezanne. Paul Cezanne is very very. Uh, important most of the painters are again french vincent van gogh probably the most famous painter uh in modern time uh paul gauguin who's french and toulouse lautrec which you probably seen a lot of his stuff but never knew that that was lautrec so let's just go over and talk about some of these painters so toulouse lautrec is over here as you can see he was a very short person uh i think he suffered like from an accident when he was a kid so he had a lot of uh, difficulties in walking, but he was um, uh, as like a small giant when it came to painting. He painted a lot of posters for cabaret and the nightlife of France, as we can see over here. You can see on the top over, that's the famous Moulin Rouge. So he was kind of like very into uh, the nightlife of Paris, going around uh, at night to all these bars, talking to bartenders, prostitutes, and so forth, and creating a lot of very iconic uh paintings today they're considered very iconic but these were kind of like posters 
uh, back in the day, kind of promoting the clubs and what's going on over there. And again, we can see the colors. He was very interested in blue, uh, sorry, in black and red um, scarves. Kind of looks very, very French. You know, it's kind of like French fashion. You kind of see from that uh, time. So to lose Latrac, very famous for for poster paintings. Uh, let's move on and talk about Cezanne. Cezanne is very, very famous for uh, still life with fruits. You know, he was very show off. He like how he can paint the best fruit you've ever seen. Uh, landscape uh, is something he was interested in also, where he lived not far from Mont Saint Victor, which he actually painted like every day, like for several times again and again. It was just outside of his studio. He just kept on painting that place for forever. And some people kind of saying like he was like a forerunner of cubism, basically kind of what he did was basically the foundation of what later on will be cubism. We'll talk about it kind of like sim simplistic geometric shapes that he was interested in. So the card players, very, very famous painting. I think this is one of the most expensive painting ever sold. I think some, uh, uh, family in the middle East bought this painting like not long ago for like $300 million. And it gets like, people are like, why are you paying so much money for that stuff? But again, people are, these, uh, these paintings are just getting more and more expensive. But other than the price tag, which again, we, we just capture uh, a certain moment of the day, kind of like the impressionists are going in for. And these two people just playing cards, you know, something you can still see to this, to this day. And there's a, by the way, it's a whole series of like five paintings regarding the card players to, if you want to, Google it and look it up, all the other ones. Um, another thing, he was very, very, very famous for the still life and famous for saying, I will astonish Paris with an apple, like like nobody can do. And look at these, man, these are really, really beautiful, the way he set up the fruits and the way he painted them. Like, uh, uh, he was a show off, but he could definitely... Uh, Definitely paint. Let's move on and talk about another famous, uh, famous post-impressionist painting painter who didn't live for a long time but had a huge influence on painting, and that's uh, George Seurat. Um, that was very, very famous. I think they even did a musical on him, like uh, Sunday in the Park. Uh, I think Stephen Sondheim. So he was interested in kind of leisure activ activities in Paris, um, and he invented maybe a subcategory of painting, which is called uh, pointillism, if you never heard of that. And that's when you take like, um, and just, you take the paintbrook and just like hit it again and again in one point and you just go over the whole painting. And that's basically a category of called pointillism, which might give you a little arthritis, but it's really, really amazing the results that you get from that kind of technique. So that's his, this is this most famous painting Sunday afternoon in the park. Now, if you zoom in to this painting, if you get really, really close to it, I think it's actually in the U.S. I think it's like, I don't know where it is. I think it's Chicago or something. It's in the U.S., I think, this painting. Um, I'll double check it later. You can, you can Google it. Uh, but again, the whole painting, if you get closer, is just done by these little dots that he did very, very close by. And it's really, really amazing painting. There's been so much analysis uh, for this painting. But again, it's just kind of like showing you kind of like what people do today. On Sunday afternoon, they go to the park. They're next to the water. Um, we can see the shade playing a role over here that's coming on top in that area. So this is kind of like maybe you can see the way they're dressed, kind of like the more middle class, upper class. If you already start talking about AP Europe to kind of distinct between the emerging urban society with the rise of the middle class. That example, if you want to use, if you write an essay, you might use this as an outside evidence, like mentioning Surat and Sunday afternoon in the park as a reflection of the urban society. Remember when you write a DBQ, a lot of times any outside evidence can be helpful uh, for you to get an extra point in your essay. Just naming one person as an example. A lot of students struggle to come up with outside evidence. So this is one example. Now, the opposite of that is the bather, bathers and unjage that you can see here. This, some people see, it's like the opposite painting of that. Maybe this is kind of like more the lower class uh, painting. That was the upper class. This is the lower class. And you can kind of just see them. Similar situation. Maybe they're on the opposite side of the river. So a lot of people think maybe these paintings are parallel, but two 
a different kind of groups. Most people don't talk about this painting. They talk about the first one being his most famous painting. So sad to say that he died very, very young, but really uh, transformed uh, painting. Now, everyone's favorite and most famous, of course, of all, is Vincent van Gogh, which is probably the most, I think, probably the most known uh, painter in modern time. Uh, and the classic way you view an artist, somebody who was like not successful most of his life and poor and ended up like his painting sell for hundreds of millions today. So the topics he was interested, uh, kind of like Rembrandt, he did a lot of self-portraiture to reflect himself. Uh, never, always with the mouth uh, closed, by the way. He had like rotten teeth. Uh, flowers, he was very, very interested. Landscape, still life. So he did a variety of uh, things. But again, he was mentally like uh, unstable. He had a lot of, we don't, we're not sure exactly what mental disease he suffered from, but a lot of times he would have episodes and this is where his creativity would would burst. So there's a lot of connection between your mental state and the art that you create. There's a lot of connection that people like Caravaggio, great painters, a lot of times like the crazy artist, he's like the most famous example of that. And he basically, um, when he came to, he, he, he was Dutch, he was born in the Netherlands. When he came to Paris, he was really like an awe by the Impressionists. And also he was very uh, interested in a new phenomenon that was very, very popular in France. It was a lot of uh, prints from Japan. And uh, basically he said, all my work is based, based to some extent about Japanese art. So they used to import a lot of these uh, uh, little uh, postcards of uh, Japanese uh, artwork. And Van Gogh was just shocked and just in awe of these things. And he constantly copy them. So basically the Japanese art that influenced Van Gogh, so if you want to do basically impressionism plus Japanese art, you put it together and you get Vincent Van Gogh. That's how you get Vincent Van Gogh. The colors basically transformed the way he painted. And that's the end result. If you see something like that, it's one of his most famous paintings, Starry Night. And we kind of see like uh, some people refer to this as like maybe a church. He was a very religious person also, but you can kind of see the circling, the the colors. They're so like experiencing uh, his emotions. So this painting, I mean, I went to, this actually is in the MoMA in um, New York City, if you ever get to Manhattan, 53rd Street. So you can see this uh, amazing painting. And I mean, you can stand around it. They'll give you a lecture for an hour. There's so much stuff in it, but we don't have time. We have a short stream. It's an amazing uh, painting, Starry Night. Sunflowers, also a very famous painting that he did, um, which again sold for hundreds of millions. Uh, Self-portraiture that, uh, that Vincent was very interested in and saying, I'd rather paint people's eyes than cathedrals, kind of like not interested in an object interested in people, emotions, and so forth. And again, the bright color, notice the blue that is behind them. And this is, again, a very sad uh, self-portraiture of Van Gogh. As a lot of time people are know Van Gogh for a sad reason that he slashed a part, a part of his ear. So here is a, a struggling artist that is like mentally um, going through a difficult stage. And we can see this in this portraiture behind him and again still see his interest behind here there's a Japanese artwork that he was interested in. and we can see the easel behind that he's basically telling us that he's a painter so I find this painting very very uh, emotional and sad for me but again everyone sees a different thing uh, in this uh, painting the, definitely the struggling artist sad to say that only sold one painting in his lifetime and was not really appreciated the genius that he was uh, let's move to somebody else. Let's talk about Paul Gauguin. And by the way, you can use Vincent van Gogh and Gauguin and Picasso even as an example of European painters that are interested in art outside of Europe or interested in, uh, in art outside of Europe. So van Gogh is an example of somebody who's interested in Japanese art, claiming it's the best art ever. And Gauguin, of course, is very famous for uh, painting uh, Tahiti natives. Yeah, and he actually moved to live in Tahiti. Uh, so he was actually seeing the primitive as being more exotic, him and uh, people like Picasso. So if you studied imperialism, if you studied 
Um, social Darwinisms, here we have people that don't see them as beneath us and actually see that the native population maybe are having a, a better time than uh, the Europeans who are moving into an urban society. So that's another very interesting thing. Uh, famous painting was very interested also in religion. This is famous, the Yellow Christ. Uh, and interesting, like he liked to take an historical pick paintings and maybe put them in modern settings, kind of like something Caravaggio used to look. So you can see it very quickly that um, what these women are dressed, this is not clothing from uh, uh, something like modern day Israel and Jerusalem. This is not what people wore 2000 years ago. This is something that people wore in France and he's basically bringing Jesus into France. Same thing in this uh, vision of the after of the ceremony. This is probably one of his most famous painting, the famous biblical story of we see over here is uh, Jacob uh, wrestling with the angel. And we see um, uh, these nuns or religious women coming out of the uh, the church after a religion, uh, after, a ser uh, uh, after attending church, basically. And they're having this vision. They're basically kind of seeing what could have been the topic of the day that was discussed in Church. So that vision, they're seeing it and actually watching. You see this person over here is praying. It's a very, very interesting painting. And again, if you look at some of these paintings, if you take uh, some time to analyze them, you will start noticing a lot of details and very, very interesting uh, things in them. Sometimes we just look at a painting, we just look for a second and then we just move, move away. My recommendation, if you go to any museum, uh, if you see some of these classic paintings just stand around for a few minutes, you really, really will start seeing a lot more details coming into you. Uh, Gauguin is also probably very, very famous, the fact that he actually left France for a variety of reasons uh, and lived in Tahiti and actually painted a lot of these native women. And he did versus a lot of artists that made him look like very uh, weird out of shape and like, you know, like compared to the classic, what they saw European beauty. Gokan is actually seeing a lot of beauty in the native women and paint them in a very uh, complimentary sense. So we have here a European artist that is not, uh, that, is, that is thinking that these are interesting subject uh, for painting. So that's a very interesting, uh, change if you're doing continuity and change in European art that these topics are appearing here uh, for the first time. And he has some uh, background of uh, some uh, some uh, South American ancestry. Uh, very interesting to to learn if you haven't studied that that um, that uh, Gauguin is actually descended from Flora Tristan. Anyone study Flora Tristan yet? Anyone? She is a famous uh, socialist, a very famous female socialist. Some people even say founder of uh, socialist or feminism movement. There's a lot of women get credit for starting the feminist movement, movement like Mary Wollstonecraft. But anyway, he's the grandson of uh, Flora Tristan. If you studied her, that's very interesting to make that connection. But anyway, uh, he has some South American... Uh, background for some of his ancestors. They were, I think one of his ancestors was also like a viceroy, viceroy in uh, the Americas, one of the last ones. And finally, the most famous painter uh, of the 20, 20th century, the second part, and he was successful during his lifetime, not like Vincent van Gogh, of course, is Pablo Picasso. And um, which again, a lot of artists during seem as the most important artists of the 20th century that really, really transform uh, modern art. So he was born in Spain in 1881 and he moved to Paris in 1904. So he did most of his career in Paris. That's why a lot of people always say Picasso, he's French. Uh, like he's not French, he's Spanish, but he did paint most of his life in uh, France. Uh, this biography is interesting. It was mentioning that his first word was is which means uh, pencil. And interestingly enough, his dad was also an art teacher. So it's not far off for how he ended up uh, being a painter. A lot of female painters, in case we didn't mention enough today, um, uh, turn out their parents were uh, painters. So for female painters, the fact that their dad was a painter was a, um, something that get him into that line of work. Um, 
Now he was interested in kind of like getting into what m more what modern art is today, like uh, two dimensional or three dimensional uh, images of a person, not just one dimensional uh, object. And he lived like he lived a really long time. He lived up to like to his nineties, and he created more than twenty thousand pieces of art. So that's why like a lot of people might say, "I have a Picasso here." There's a Picasso there. It's not that were to have uh, things with the name Picasso uh, on them. And he was very, very successful in his lifetime, uh, like a millionaire. So his paintings sold very well during his lifetime. And he was aware like that his signature basically made the painting expensive. He knew that. He had this nasty thing. He wasn't a nice person in real life. He had this nasty thing with a lot of some of his lovers that when he left them, he would give him a painting as a gift, but he would not sign his name on it. Kind of like, here, you can have my painting, but you're not going to make any money of it. Uh, now, he is famous for basically the creation of a new art movement, the last one we're talking about today, and that's Cubism. And he kind of started with kind of like more of an experimental phase. If you study Picasso, we're not going to make it too complicated for tonight. But he went through different phases where he kind of recreated art in different way. So what he liked to do is kind of this artistic way of like kind of like assembling and breaking everything together. So you take an object, you basically break it up, and then you kind of reassemble it and uh that's basically what you get more later on, what's, what's called abstract. And he was also very interested, if again, we mentioned Gauguin, interested in, um, in native uh, population and, and Van Gogh, interested in Japanese art. Picasso was interested in African sculpture that comes across in a lot of his art. And he likes distorted forms. And that's basically what modern art is. If you get to modernism, is a lot of times instead of everything being clear, I'm just going to like, you know, kind of disassemble it. And that's why some people, when they go to modern arts, like if you go to the Mo MoMA Museum of Modern Art, you know, I always see people walking around and they look at something and they're saying, that's not art. Or like, what is it? So it's something that is very, very uh, confusing to, to see here. Basically that uh, like this painting over here, it's uh, somebody playing a guitar, but then it's like how many shapes are like are in it is like, is where's the head or where's the, there's many way you can rearrange this painting and sometimes people do like collages of things and just kind of rearrange like a jigsaw puzzle these sort of uh painting now classic example of his most one of his most famous painting and probably the most famous anti-war painting picasso did is called guernica and it was done in 1937 uh the context of the painting anyone knows what the context of the painting is but what's going on in Europe in 1937? So the context of the painting is actually the Spanish Civil War. So this is kind of like if you're getting closer to study about the rise of dictatorship across uh, Europe, uh, Spain also had a dictator named Franco. And and one famous event, like the city of Guernica, was basically bombed and uh, innocent civilian died. And, and Picasso painted this painting over here that you can kind of see like, um, and again, you can see like these objects. You can see the hands lifted up here. It's basically destruction after a bombing, what we're seeing in this painting. So it was very, very shocking for, for that time. And a famous story about Picasso that... Uh, when the Nazis came into his apartment, uh, they saw his art, and one of one of the soldiers like took one of a painting that kind of like looked like this, like a, like a distort figures, and showed it to Picasso and said, "Did you do that?" And Picasso turned to the soldier and said, "No, you did that." So Picasso was <laughs> a very ballsy guy, but yeah, he basically was saying, you're the one who's doing like the killing. It's not me. So that's another famous uh, saying. So this painting is still very, very talked about to this day as a famous iconic painting of uh, anti-war, the destruction of war. There's very, very interesting today. So Cubism is the last art movement uh, that we're talking today. But it's basically, just to summarize, it's kind of like breaks up the images and the shapes and showing multiple side of angles at the same time. So like 
sometimes you know Picasso will paint like I don't know he's like his manager would do a self portrait of him, but he was kind of reassemble his face in a whole different way. And some people were like, "Who is this guy? That doesn't look like him." But that's what he created with that art. And uh, Picasso is uh, by art historians, by painters, is considered very very respected today by by his innovative work what he created for the art world. Most people who don't understand art too much like don't really get what the big deal about Picasso is and just know that he's very, uh, that his paintings are very uh, famous. Um, he's famous for, uh, all right, the uh, last painting we'll talk about is, uh, when we talk about African mask is, uh, I'm gonna butcher my French a little bit off, is Le Mademoiselle de Avignon that you can see that there's like an African mask here. So he was very interested in African mask and to add them into this art. And we can kind of see the angles that are coming from the side. So again, what is he doing here? We're moving away from realistic paintings as we started the streams. We went into impressionism with more light brush stocks, less being accurate. And we're finishing off like around the early 20th century with cubism with more pointed angles and more distorted figures that kind of reflects of the state of art that people are saying like, you know, like maybe art is not supposed to be all beautiful or could be that this is beautiful to him and it's all depends on the guy who's seen it, what is high art. And again, this is also was very, very controversial and very talked about uh, painting that Picasso did, La Mademoiselle d'Avignon. That's the way he saw them. That's the way he depicted them. And the African mask is also a very interesting part of that. So to finish up, just remember, think fibable. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. There's a link here to my website. Uh, Alam Tai Chi, I also teach Tai Chi and Qigong. Here's a link to my book. Sorry for the shameless plug, but you know, everyone's got to plug one thing in their time. And the video that we started in the beginning of the stream, maybe we'll see it one more time and see if you can recognize any of these paintings that we saw throughout the stream. The days. Beautiful. All right. So thank you everyone for joining tonight's stream. If there's any question when we finish it up, anyone want to ask a question about any of this art we did today? So going forward next week, I'm going to do a stream uh, in APUSH about the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King. If you're taking APUSH interested, join me in that stream. I'll do more stream in the future on the Cold War. I have a stream coming up and uh, also the rise of fascism. So again, stay tuned with Fibable. If some of you have more uh, lessons coming up of your school uh, might be closing now. So this is a good time for you to um, follow Fibable, tell your friends about it and enjoy these videos. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight and good night.